Strap on your seatbelts. The pilot has turned on the seatbelt sign. Some turbulence is ahead. We're, we're leaving the, the letters to the churches behind, the sort of epistle part of the book. We're leaving behind John's vision that he had in heaven. And here's where we really get into some of the weird stuff. Some of the stuff that's a little bit harder to understand, but is really the exciting part of the book of the Revelation. What we saw last week in chapter 5 was this scroll. The scroll that John saw in heaven. And he realized that this scroll was of incredible importance. Because the scroll represents the destiny of man. It represents the future of the earth. And it is, in many ways, a title deed to our planet. A deed that we as humans turned over to Lucifer in the Garden of Eden, and who the Lamb of God, who was the only person found in all of creation worthy to take that scroll, is now going to open it up. And, it's, and as I mentioned last week, it's kind of like going through escrow. As each seal is, is broken in that scroll, different things happen as the Lord begins to reverse the curse that came about because of what we did in the Garden of Eden and begins to return to prepare the earth for, for his return. So pretty much as the, the rest of the book transpire, transpires, everything from here all the way through chapter 19 is the result of the opening of the seven seals that have closed up this scroll. Now, chapter 6 really begins what we might call the period of the Tribulation, with a capital T. And it's broken up into two periods. The last half of the Tribulation, the last three and a half years, is known as the Great Tribulation. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, that if the days of that Tribulation had not been cut short, no one would survive. And as we're going to see, even partially today, that is absolutely true. But as it is, all of the stuff that we're going to see that transpires in the rest of this book, all the plagues and the wars and the attacks of the enemy forces, are going to take about half of all the known population of planet Earth will die. Unbelievable. That's about, um, well, it's... What is it? Several billion people will die because of this. So let's take a look. Hold your place there in Revelation chapter 6 and turn back to Matthew chapter 24. I just want to take a quick look at what Jesus said about this period of time. Matthew chapter 24. His disciples have asked him in, uh, at, in verse 3, as they sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and they said, Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the close of the age. And, and Jesus said to them, answered them, See that no one uh, leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, uh, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. So, keep in mind, as we're going to go back to Revelation 6, that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilence, as it says in the King James, and also earthquakes. The time of the tribulation has these features. So that's kind of a description of what it's about. But where does it come from? Why do we even talk about this thing called the tribulation, this final seven-year period of history? Did somebody just say, oh, let's just make up the last seven years and we'll call it the tribulation? No. Actually, it was prophesied a very long time ago. So let go of Matthew 24, but hold on to Revelation 6. And let's go back to our key to understanding the book of Revelation, which is the book of Daniel. The prophet Daniel. Go back to Daniel chapter 9. Now, Daniel, if you remember, was uh, an Israelite. 
He was one of the first ones taken out of the land of Israel when God judged that nation for falling away from him. And he judged the land and he took all the inhabitants out and he took them to Babylon. And Daniel was kind of the, one of the cream of the crop that was there, a real promising person. And they took him to Babylon and he became trained as a, a royal official in that country. But Daniel was also very faithful to the Lord. And if you remember the story of the lion's den and all that sort of thing. It got Daniel into some trouble. But he remained faithful to the Lord. And he also remained faithful to the promise that God would bring them back to the land. And in chapter 9 is in the middle of this vision that Daniel is having from an angel that is showing him the things that are going to take place. And in chapter 9, starting in verse 24... The angel Gabriel comes to him, and he gives Daniel some insight into the future. So Daniel 9, starting in verse 24. And he says this, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks an anointed one will be cut off and she'll have nothing. And you're all going, okay. <laughs> what in the world? We won't, we won't break this all apart. Um, if you, we, we did go look into a little bit more detail in our study of, of 1 Thessalonians about uh, the rapture of the church. So you can check out that study for some more detail. But um, in just four short verses, the angel lays out the rest of world history. And it's, according to the angel, 70 weeks and we know from some other things that, that these weeks are actually weeks of years. It's 70 sevens is actually how it reads in the Hebrew. And it's broken up basically into 69 weeks and one week. Now it has to represent years partly because after they, uh, the king of Babylon gave the order to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 490 days later, nothing very interesting happened. 490 months later, nothing really happened. But exactly to the day, 490 years later, 69 weeks of years, a man walked through the gates of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and hailed himself to be Messiah, the Prince. So then it says that this prince that would come, the anointed one shall be cut off in verse 26 and have nothing. That represents the death of this person, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. So he was cut off at the end of this period of time. Now, you might wonder what the seven weeks was in there, one week and then, and then another 62 weeks. That was probably the period of time it took them to rebuild the temple. But again, we don't want to go into too much detail. This is going to be confusing enough, believe me. <laughs> so, then we're left. We've got 69 weeks that have gone by. Jesus walked through the gates of Jerusalem and said, I'm the Messiah. And the clock stopped. You know how, like in football, when they throw the, the ball out of bounds, the clock, the clock stops? Yeah, Roger, you're shaking your head. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what happened. This prophetical <laughs> clock that Gabriel told Daniel about stopped at that point in time when Messiah was cut off as having nothing. So the time between Jesus' crucifixion and today is like the stopwatch was just stopped and it hasn't been started again with this prophetical clock. This is the age of the church. Now when the church is taken out of the way, which I believe happens in something that's called the rapture 
or the snatching away of the church, which, again, I don't think there's anything that is needed to be fulfilled before that can happen. It can happen today, it can happen tomorrow, it can happen 100 years from now. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. But the Lord's going to snatch the church out of the earth, and not everybody agrees with that. It's kind of interesting, though, when you look at, at Thessalonians, where that concept is there, it's kind of hard to argue that there is actually this thing called the rapture, even though the word rapture doesn't occur in the New Testament. That's because it's a translation. The Greek word is harpazo, and it means to snatch like you're pulling a piece of ripe fruit off a tree, quickly and suddenly. That word translates into Latin as something like raptus, or it's some form of that word where we get the word raptor, like a you know, velociraptor in Jurassic Park, because they would snatch really quickly, I guess is where they got that name. And so then we in English get the word rapture. So the concept is there in the word. I believe that the Lord is going to take the church out of the scene. That will actually begin the clock started, starting again. Now why partly do I believe in that? I don't want to get into a lot of detail. But you notice at the beginning of what we saw here in Daniel chapter, chapter 9, verse 24, the angel says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. This is a prophecy about Israel. And when Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah, the prophecy and the Lord dealing with Israel basically was put on hold. Then begins this age of the church, and Paul talks a lot about it. We are actually grafted in, Paul says, to the blessing that comes to Israel. But then when we're pulled out, God's focus again turns to Israel, and a lot of the period of the tribulation is the nation of Israel once again turning to Jesus as the Messiah and saying, we were wrong. The prophecy says that they will look on him whom they have pierced. They will repent of what they did, and the nation will turn around. We're going to see in the coming weeks, God's going to re-energize those folks like you wouldn't believe. And, and you think we've got great evangelists around here today. There are going to be 144,000 super evangelists going around the earth preaching the gospel. So once again, during this final seven-year period, God's focus turns back to Israel as they come back to Him. And I won't go into this in really detail, but you know, there's some cool, cool stuff. The Bible is just its so integrated all the way through. Um, there's kind of some neat numerology stuff that goes on there. Seven is God's number, and ten is the number of what is possible with man. It's not man's number, but it's what man is capable of doing. Like we have, later on you'll see ten horns, which represent ten nations. So, seventy weeks is like man allowing, or God allowing man to see what he can do on the earth. But then, that number is multiplied again by seven, showing that God is totally in control of the whole thing. Anyway, I won't go more into that. I just, I get off and stuff like that. So. Okay, so then, we're still in Daniel. Now look at, at verse 26. After, as, as I said, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and have nothing. So between the period after nothing and the word and is like, you know, 2,000 years. So God fits a lot in the spaces between the sentences there. <laughs> and he shall, it says, uh, um, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That actually did occur in 70 AD. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Kind of reminds you what Jesus said in Matthew 24. And he, verse 27, shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. That, my friends, is the tribulation. And you see, one week period of time, when a world ruler will come on the scene, the person known as the Antichrist, he will make this incredible peace covenant for a seven year period of time and halfway through it he'll break it and he'll actually go to a rebuilt temple, declare himself to be God, put an end to the normal sacrifices that will be taking place there and then literally all hell will break loose on planet earth for those final three and a half years, a period which if Jesus said if it hadn't been cut short, no one would have survived. So. 
At the end of this tribulation period, there's going to be this all-out war, series of battles, really. And then in the end, Jesus will finally set his feet down on the Mount of Olives. We will come back with him as the armies of heaven. He will wipe out the Antichrist and all of his forces. And then will break forth this incredible thousand-year period of peace and harmony on the earth as Jesus himself will rule from Jerusalem. So that brings us back to Revelation chapter 6. We're, I kind of gave you the bird's eye view of the prophecies regarding the tribulation, the characteristics that will take place, and now we come to the beginnings of it. Verse 1 of chapter 6 in the book of the Revelation. Again, we're going to see the opening. We're going to see six of the seals opened in this chapter. Now, this is pretty heavy into symbolism here, okay? So, it takes a little bit of explaining to do as we, as we walk through this. But this, even though they're symbols, they're symbols of something very real and very terrible. And the first uh, seals that we see here may be recognizable to you if you've ever heard the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Have you ever heard that phrase before? That's where it comes from, is chapter 6 right here. So, let's look at verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Okay, so here's this horse that comes riding out, a white horse, and there's a, there's a person on it. Now some people have suggested this is Jesus Christ, but I don't think so. Um, it doesn't fit with the description we see of Jesus in chapter 19. Most likely, this person is the Antichrist. This person of the people who will come that Daniel talked about, and the he there in, in verse 27 of chapter 9 of Daniel. The Antichrist comes in peace, which is what a white horse symbolizes. <laughs> but his real purpose is not peace, but war and death. That's why it says he comes to conquering and to conquer. This individual, and remember, anti doesn't mean opposed to, although he is. Anti means replacement. So it, it is a replacement Christ, a replacement for Jesus Christ will come on the scene. And he will have political power, political authority, and military might for this seven-year period. But even though he comes in peace, his purpose is not peace. So the beginning of the seals, remember how I was talking about how it's kind of man's ultimate, this, this, this is man's <coughs> ultimate opportunity to rule. And so um, this is the unveiling of man's ultimate challenge to God. Saying, we don't need a God, we are God. That's the whole idea with the Antichrist. <coughs> That was Satan's rebellion, that he wanted to be like God, and he infected us with that same thing. So again, at first, the period of the tribulation, people left on the earth, they'll go, tribulation? What tribulation? This is the greatest time that planet earth has ever seen. <coughs> you ever watch uh, Star Trek, one of the various permutations of that series? The world that's portrayed in Star... I always find it interesting, you know, they portray Earth as we have finally learned. We have overcome our differences and we no longer have war. We all get along together, everybody's fed. You know, it's, it's kind of like Nirvana on Earth. I always find it interesting, they always describe Earth that way, but yet they're out here with the latest weapons always shooting at everybody in space. So I don't know how they, those two come together. But in a way, the world described in Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek is kind of like what the beginning of the tribulation will be like. Unbelievable peace and prosperity and unity. The Middle East problem, which has plagued man for thousands of years, will finally be solved. Everyone will be happy. The world religions will get along because they got rid of those pesky Christians that were just so narrow-minded of talking about the way, the truth, and the light. That's just so bigoted and... We finally got rid of them. I don't know what happened to them. Maybe aliens took them. Maybe it was bird flu. You know, we don't really know, but they're gone. Hallelujah. Now we can all get along together. There, there will not be the sense at the beginning that anything is coming that is bad. Everybody will think that everything is wonderful. But 
it will be short-lived. By the way, uh, we are fast moving in our world today towards a one world government and a one world religion. And I won't take the time, we'll be here for hours, but there's a lot of stuff out there. that it's, We're fast heading that way. It'll be welcomed in when the time is right. So this is the unveiling of the Antichrist who comes at the beginning of the tribulation period. So then verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that men should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. So this represents, the first, the first horse represented political power, vested in the Antichrist for this final seven years of earth's history. This horse represents military power. During the tribulation, especially in the latter part of it, there will be a series of wars and battles, like I mentioned, that will lead up to what's called the Battle of Armageddon, which you've probably heard of. The, ba the Battle of Armageddon, which we'll see later on in the book, um, in, especially in chapter 16. So, um, then in verse 5, let's just move on through these. Verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse... So white, red, and black. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Okay. This represents the economic conditions during the tribulation period. This horse represents famine and the inequalities that will emerge during the tribulation. Now remember from Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said there would be famines. And recently we've seen the reemergence of a lot of famine on our earth, especially over in Africa. Those famines will be nothing compared to what will take place during the period of the tribulation. But, we also see here that the rich will continue to be able to get what they want. Where it says there a, um, a quart of wheat for a denarius, a denarius was about what, it, what you earned in a day. So you would have to work for an entire day in order to buy just a quart of wheat. You know, how big a quart is. That's not very much. It wouldn't make very much for your family. And you'd have to work an entire day for that. So it shows that the value of food will grow incredibly as there is less and less of it in these, in these places where famines are breaking out. And yet, it says, do not harm the oil and wine, which would be a symbol of those things that the rich people would still be able to get. The rich would still have resources that they would be able to live in luxury. Now, this is actually typified by a city that we're going to see in chapter 17, Babylon the Great, where it'll be incredibly rich so the period of the tribulation will be a period of economic inequality where the poor will be very poor, but the rich will still be able to get all the luxuries that they have had before. So verse 7, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And its rider was death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts on the earth. So this represents kind of the, the health conditions that will be there during the period of the tribulation, the horrible loss of life that will occur from disease and war and famine and natural disaster. And we're going to see all of those aplenty in the chapters that come. The current population of the earth is about six and a half billion people. And so right here, we see that this, this horse and the forces that, that are represented here are given the authority to take a quarter of the Earth's population. That's 1.6 billion people. And we just heard a couple of days ago in the Philippines where a, a mountain came loose and formed a torrent of mud and it came down so quickly on a village that out of 1,800 people, only 57 survived. Everyone else was buried alive and killed. And I don't know if they've found any survivors since then. No. 
That's 1,800 people and we mourn. And it's horrible, it really is. A few weeks ago, there was a ferry boat that capsized and hundreds of people lost their lives. And we mourn. We had the Twin Towers that were, were uh, destroyed by terrorists in 2001 and thousands of people died and we mourn. Think about 1.6 billion people dying. That ought to get your attention. And with the other things that take place in this book, upwards of a half of the population of the Earth, 3.2 billion people will be killed. <coughs> That's actually one of the reasons why I personally believe that the events that we see in these chapters going forward in the book of the Revelation haven't taken place yet because we have not seen anything nearing this sort of destruction anywhere in Earth's history <coughs> after the flood, of course. Okay, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. And that could be brothers and sisters, means siblings, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. This represents the terrible martyrdom that will take place during the period of the Revelation. This Antichrist, uh, back up a little bit, told you about the evangelists that are going to come around. Man, they're going to be incredible. There are people that are, going to, that are going to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ during this final seven year period of time. But even as the evangelical power will be great, so will be the forces rallied against the gospel. And this Antichrist and his servants will hunt down anyone who receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and lop off their heads. They'll be executed. It will be a horrible time to be a Christian. You will have a very difficult time even eating because of the way the economic situation will be changed, forcing people to bow their hearts and lives to the Antichrist just in order to be able to buy and sell food. And many of them will die. And so, um, here they're asking the Lord for justice and for vengeance against those that had taken their lives. And they are good things. But I do want to point out here, it's God that will bring about that vengeance. And God even says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Now, in a way, and I'm not dogmatic on this at all, and there are, as you can imagine, a lot of different ways to interpret the book of the Revelation. And there's a whole lot more detail that we could get into. But I want to suggest to you one way that we can look at the events of these first seals here in chapter 6 is kind of a thematic outline. And the book of the Revelation is not necessarily in chronological order. Some of it is, but not all of it. So you can't just say, okay, this event takes place right after this one. And in a way, what this chapter is doing is setting forth the themes of the things that will take place. The Antichrist, the first horse, he's not going to go away when the second horse comes on the scene. He's going to still be there for that, throughout that seven-year period, um, the, the last seven years of Earth's uh, history. So the actual events, some of them are cataloged in later chapters. Okay, so now, look at verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Remember earthquakes? Jesus said about that. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Natural disasters that will take place during the period of the revolution, uh, the tribulation. As really creation almost rebels itself as, as God begins to reverse the curse that has held the, uh, the creation. The sky become black, come, becomes black. Okay, um, could be that these earthquakes are uh, volcanic in nature. We're going to see in the coming chapters there's a strong suggestion that some of the huge natural disasters that will take place 
are because of volcanoes. Um, also, large objects that will fall from the sky and cause even more uh, damage. And I won't, won't get into that in particular right now. But what I'm saying is that all this uh, disruption of the norm on the Earth's surface can actually cause incredible amounts of volcanic ash and dust to enter the atmosphere, actually dimming what sunlight reaches the Earth. The moon becomes blood. Have you ever watched the full moon rise like through the atmosphere of the city of Portland? It really almost looks like blood because of the pollutants in the atmosphere. Well, this, this effect would be greatly intensified um, during the tribulation. They didn't have a reference point in the day that this was written to the moon becoming blood. They wouldn't understand what that meant. It's a symbol, though, for what the moon will look like. It looked to John like it was blood. The moon had become blood. But we have kind of an idea of what can cause that because of all the pollution that we have in our Earth today. So you would think, after all of this stuff happening, what started out as this great period of world peace and unity, and as suddenly all this horrible stuff has happened and all these people have died, you'd think the people on planet Earth would go, you know what? Maybe those Christians had something after all. We better check out that Bible thing and read about Jesus because there's something going on here we don't understand and we need to turn our hearts back to the Lord and, and come in repentance and fall on our knees and there would be this worldwide change of heart and people would come to Jesus and by the millions. It's not going to happen. Look at the last part of this chapter. Verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, look what they do, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us. Now, you would think just kind of naturally, if people were experiencing horrible things, and they didn't understand where they were coming from, they might go, you know, we just need to hide away from all of these things because we don't know what's happening. But the next part of this verse shows they knew exactly, they will know exactly what's taking place and why. Because look what they say. Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Mankind will know without a shadow of a doubt that the period of time in which they are living the things that are taking place are a result of God's judgment, God's wrath, to a sinful and rebellious earth. By the way, little tidbit right there, this is yet another reason why I believe that Christians will not be here during this period of time known as the Tribulation. Why? Because it, it will be evident that what is taking place here is the wrath of the Lamb. But the scriptures are very specific about the fact that we who believe in Jesus Christ are not subject to wrath anymore. Because the wrath of God was poured out, not as it is here on a sinful and rebellious earth, it was poured out on the shoulders of Jesus Christ on the cross. And all the stuff that we deserve because of our rebellion against God, Jesus absorbed on our behalf, and so we no longer are subject to wrath, the wrath of God. So it would be incongruous and, and, and um, um, really opposite of God's word for the Christians to be here during this time and receiving the wrath of the Lamb. So again, that's just a little tidbit. So all the great um, systems of planet Earth, the political systems, the kings and the great ones, the military systems, the generals, the economic systems, the rich and the powerful, every uh, layer of socioeconomic, the slave and the free, they will all be affected by this. But it will be obvious to all of them what is taking place, and their response will be to hide away from God. Remind you of a couple who in the Garden of Eden realized they had sinned, and what did they do? They hid from God. That is man's response when he's called on the carpet for sin. Now why would these things happen? Why would these things happen? I want to give 
for you a possibility that I believe very strongly. You would look at these things that take place in chapter 6, and you would think, isn't God mean? He's just mean. How come he's doing this? I thought the Bible said God is love. How can a loving God allow 3.2 billion people to die? That's not God. That can't be God. God is out there to try and save people. He's not out to destroy people. Ah, yes. That is exactly true. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Here's the character of God. God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Here's my point. I believe God will use any means possible, not to hurt people, but to save them. To bring them to repentance and a knowledge of the truth. And he uses various different means. Right now, you could say God is using the hands-off approach. Jesus went back to heaven and he empowered all of us as his servants with his Holy Spirit to go around and to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to witness to other people what God has done in our lives. And so then people respond to that and they come to believe in Jesus and they join the church. That's not the only means at God's disposal. There is also what you might call the hands-on approach, which would be showing in demonstrable ways, his judgment and wrath against sin. It will be obvious to the people who live on planet Earth that this is the judgment of God. If you're being judged by God and you know, you know, there's a way I can escape this judgment, but I have to give up on myself and bow my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. That's kind of a much more powerful hands-on approach that God will use, but the end is still to save people. Then, after Jesus Christ returns to the earth, you might say he takes the personal approach. People will say, well, if, if God really exists, why does he come down here and show himself to me? Well, be patient now. He's going to do that. A few things have to happen before that takes place, but he's coming, don't worry. And then everyone will actually be able to see him and he'll be able to speak. And that will be his approach during the millennium. He will rule from Jerusalem and we, his servants, will help him rule the earth, um, and the capital of the earth will be Jerusalem, and people will be able to go and visit with Jesus Christ. It'll be incredible. So you think, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, God should come down on earth and show himself to me personally, and then I'll believe him. Well, i got to tell you, there's some bad news there. You know, this great thousand-year period of peace and prosperity where the Lord rules the earth, men will still have free will. And at the end of that period of time, Lucifer, who has been chained for a thousand years, will be let loose. And he'll go around the earth in his same old fashion, bringing people back into that rebellion against God. And he will raise up this huge army that will come against Jerusalem and try to overthrow the king of the universe. Is that dumb or what? <laughs> and that will signal the end of time as we know it. And that's the point at which... The earth is destroyed, and the new heavens and the new earth take place and all of that. But so, God has taken the hands-off approach. You know, I don't, I'm not pushing you. I'm just letting you know the truth. People will reject God. He takes the hands-on approach. You know, here's my judgment. Now, is, doesn't this scare you? It ought to. And if I'm going to scare you into the kingdom, at least I'm going to get you into the kingdom. People will still rebel. He takes the personal approach. I'm standing right here in front of you, and you're rejecting me? Yes. Because you see, the heart of man is in rebellion against God. It's all about us against God. Our self-will against bowing our hearts to this one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So now, about this time, your head is probably swimming, and you're going, let's see, is it a red horse and a blue horse, or is it a red horse and a fuchsia horse, and what did it, was it famine, and you know, 
don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> um, you know, how, do, how in the world do I keep all this straight? Do, you know, am I not a real good Christian if I can't, you know, describe the four horsemen of the apocalypse in order and all that stuff? No. You don't have to uh, know this stuff in detail in order to be able to share what the book of the Revelation is about and what your faith in Jesus Christ is about. Because really the short version of what we learn here is that God has a plan for salvation of everyone. But it's only found through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as God prepares for his return to earth, we have here this one last gasp of humanity trying to play God and God judging them for it. Now, yes, many people will die. But we also know something else about God's character. He wants all men to be saved. He is also just. Chapter 19, verse 2. Everyone will declare, your judgments are true and just. No one's going to be able to argue with God and say, you're so unfair. It's not going to happen. Because he's not unfair. Everyone gets what they deserve. Except those of us who have allowed Jesus to receive what we deserve on the cross. Because truly all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin are death. However, the free gift of God is eternal life. And where is it found? In Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's be among those who don't get what we deserve. By giving our hearts to Jesus and having a relationship with Him. Okay, next time we see the super saints from Israel. Let's pray. Lord, we, we read about all of the, the terrible things that happen and all the loss of life and all the rebellion that will take place in men's hearts during this period of time. And it does strike fear into our hearts. And we do mourn even now for that, the tremendous cost that will take place as you prepare to return. And I guess, Lord, my prayer today is that during this time when you take the sort of hands-off approach, you would move strongly in our hearts and minds and lives. Put us in situations, Lord, where we can share what you have done for us with other people so that no one has to go through this period of time unnecessarily. Lord, use us. Empower us by your Spirit. We can't do it on our own. But make us your super saints in a way doing the work of your Holy Spirit, empowered by your Holy Spirit. Soften the hearts of the people that we come in contact with, Lord, so that they too can know you now and don't have to fear you later. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.